Okay. Good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you this afternoon or whatever time you're tuning in the program call? What's going on on allpointstv.com? We come to you every Monday from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And every second and fourth Mondays of each month, we are followed by Satori's Black History Corner. And you're not going to have that particular gift after this program is over today because it's not the second and fourth Mondays. But when we are here on those particular days, we will be the ones to set the tone for the following program called Satori's Black History Corner. I hope you stay tuned for that each of those two um, Mondays of the month. <clears throat> We're here every Monday because we know if we're not here, you'll miss us. And that's why we come together and want to share some ideas with you on a weekly basis. And we know you are staying tuned to all the programs here at allpointstv.com because we're working very hard at the studio to make sure we're bringing our programs to you at a level of quality that rivals that of all the alphabet soup on cable networks and on the um, posts. Brian Williams programs. <laughs> we try to get it a little bit better situated here as far as, far as uh, not uh, carrying, uh, uh, we, don't, we don't claim to have been uh, fighting in the Revolutionary War or having flown with the SEAL Team, SEAL Team 6, when they flew over there to uh, Pakistan and got uh, bin Laden. We don't claim to have been on the flight. We don't, we don't, we don't. <laughs> We don't tend to stretch the truth uh, beyond what we know. And any errors we make, we make it because we um, did the best we could do. We don't try to embellish. I think the word now they use is uh, embellish the news. Um, uh, you have all <laughs> we have all these ways of keeping from saying anything today that shows that we are unwilling to be honest with each other. and to say the truth as we know it, and now we have all these little ways of saying that we are lying and without saying we're lying. And so the, uh, so Brian Williams was uh, embellishing the truth. And now I read last week that uh, he, embellishing the truth is not really a problem. I guess if I guess it's not if you if you don't call it what it is, you call it <laughs> you're embellishing the truth. Well, we don't do that here at allpointstv.com, we tried to come here and <clears throat> what you see is what you get. And uh, we hope we are earning your trust each week. And feel free to call us at, and I'm going to give you a number here, 248-247-5242. Uh, 248-247-5846. And we'd like to hear from you because we want to know what you think about what we're doing out there. And if there's anything that seems like it's not integral, you let us know. And we will uh, fix that because we want to be a network that brings uh, quality programs and also programs that you can rely upon what we say here. We're trying to get it right. And we're not trying to embellish. I think that's a new word. We're, we're not trying to embellish uh, what we report here. I mean, it's the facts are the facts, and if we uh, uh, say it away in a way in which it uh, comes out where we find out later it's not the fact, we'll correct it later on in the next program. But we, we try to come here after having um, done a little bit of our homework at least, and we think we're getting it right as much as anyone out there in the uh, viewership, and also <clears throat> we, are, we are a... Uh, podcast program, so we hope we are competing with the best that's out there, and there are some good ones out there. <clears throat> I have a lot of respect for those out there that's not uh, coming through the FCC, which that may happen soon because <clears throat> there are people who are in these licensed bodies that hate our freedoms. But right now we are we are an independent uh, body, and we are able to come together on a weekly basis and share what we think is the uh, news and some of the other things we talk about here. And we're trying to get it right each time we come to you before uh, before the public here at allpointstv.com. <clears throat> that being said, we want to continue our discussion from last week, and I promised last week that I would, in fact, <clears throat> start with the book written by 
a Ghanaian historian by the name of George uh, B. N. Ayete, who has uh, four major works out, and the one I'm going to be reading from today is called Africa and Chain, the blueprint for Africa's future. I'm going to be doing this book as a part of our Black History Month series. Uh, next week I'm going to be covering, since it will be closest to the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X. As you know, Malcolm X was, was assassinated on the 21st of uh, February 1965. Uh, it will be um, the following month that they'll have uh, Selma of the say in the same year. But before that, about what was it? About two weeks before <clears throat> the Selma incident that you have the movie around uh, the march, the attempted march on the 7th of March, 1965, going from Selma to Montgomery, <clears throat> and then later on arriving there on the 25th. Well, about a month earlier, when King is in Selma giving the speech about he won't let anybody turn him around, a uh, month before that, on the 21st of February, Malcolm X had been assassinated in an Audubon ballroom. And what I want to do next week, <clears throat> during the celebration of Black History Month, since this is the 50th anniversary of that particular event, I want to um, uh, have a discussion, and I'm, 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 I guess I'm telling the people that are the Malcolm X ex experts, I'll be having a discussion <clears throat> on um, who killed Malcolm X, and also why Malcolm X was ordained in a way ordained to die and I'll be putting that together <clears throat> I got it pretty much finished already but I'll be putting the found touches on it so I can bring that to you in a holistic way in one program to talk about <clears throat> what happened so that we will um, have a, a good idea of um, what this travesty was really about and we would not be pulling any angles around uh, what occurred as so many pe people are doing um, a lot of people are trying to import a lot of things into it <clears throat> that don't belong there. And of course, there are all these outside forces they're talking about, but we want to we want to focus this conversation very particularly <clears throat> around what was going on that specifically and directly led to Malcolm X's assassination. Now, you can bring all these other insinuating circumstances into the conversation, <clears throat> but we're not going to do that here. We're going to <clears throat> cut right to the chase. And we're going to stay focused upon those things that are within this uh, movement <clears throat> that would have caused Malcolm's ouster, and then later on <clears throat> his, his assassination. And we're going to try very, we're going to try to be very specific because we want to focus in on a lot of different angles that have not been covered by anybody else. And I've been reading all the works out there about Malcolm X, <clears throat> and I can tell you that what we're saying here. Excuse me. Nobody, nobody has covered and overlooked my 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 cold today because uh, you know I don't know if you've been facing it. Uh, those of you out down over in, in California may not be aware, or maybe down in. Um, well, I have a friend down here in Mississippi that just called me before the show, and they down there in this um, 70 degree weather. Well, up here we don't have 70 degrees. We have uh, 30 degrees below, or <laughs> well, it feels like that. And so being out there and having to uh, make sure I take care of my feral cats and things like that. Yeah, I don't, I don't want people to accuse us of being Fox News. I think it's actually officially 24 or it was around 9 or 24 nine. degrees or something like that below okay. zero. Yeah. So it's about 9 degrees? Yeah, I'd say about okay. 9 degrees. Um, it only felt like 30 with the wind chill. <laughs> so we don't want to be accused of being Fox News, you know, yeah. embellishing. You don't want to get that straight. Yeah, it certainly feels a lot colder out there even with your gloves on. But being out there and putting straw... I have some, some feral cats that live in my, in my uh, window well. I have a little um, a guard around the, around the window to the basement, and it's uh, circling. They get in that little well for warmth, and when I got up um, a couple of days ago, I heard this kind of like they were crying, and I could tell, although I have an overhang of my uh, brushes, the, the bushes overhang that particular part of the yard. I could tell they were still cold, so I went to um, one of the uh, stores and got some straw. And I was out there, 
uh, first they have to they have to, you have to get them out the way of course they run when they see you coming because they don't want you to even though they, they know they know who I am because I you know you go out there and feed them they they even come close now it used to kind of you come out there to run and try to get as far away as, as they can now they come right up to you you can't hardly put the bowl down there <clears throat> but they saw me coming I announced I announced I was coming by saying here I come to save the day and <clears throat> they got out of the well and I was able to put hay and put straw in there <clears throat> but in the time it took to go through the snow, snow to get there and go up to the one and get the straw out of the container and put it in the in the well <clears throat> you were out there for a period of time and when I got back in there I, I found that I was almost uh, I had lost almost 30% uh, of my voice so I'll be clearing my throat in the program hope you will uh, overlook that we know I'm going to come here with perfect sound, though. And I always tell John before we get started. Well, see, the cats didn't mind you feeding them, but what they did mind is that you were in the cape and that high-pitched falsetto, and when you try to copy a Mighty Mouse, you know, they, yeah. they kind of thought that was odd. But, you know. Yeah. My dog, John, my dog got out. I, I was, my dog saw the cats, because when you open that door, now they hear the door opening, they knew it's feeding time. So they came and showed themselves. And when my dog, when I opened the door to go outside, I'm carrying the, the food with me. That dog squeezed out the door, and before I knew it, he chased all the cats off. So I, now I got to go and find him and get him back in the house, and then got to get my cats back into um, into the yard, and finally got fed. But that, that you know, kind of <laughs> after a while, you you go back in, you can't hardly talk. But we're here. I felt my eye and, uh, <laughs> freeze up the other day. I was walking outside. I felt my eye freeze up. Yeah, you know, my left eye. I was like, "This is not good. My yeah. eye is freezing up." <laughs> John, do, do you? Have you ever petted a feral cat? Have oh, you ever gotten close enough to them? Oh, oh yeah. They, um, after a while, they, if you, the best thing to do is if you want to get to use to them, get them used to use while they're eating, reach down and pet them a little bit. You just be very cautious because some will snap back at you. Yeah. But I don't try to pick them up, obviously. No, but, I have no. But, um, no. yeah, that's how you do it is you feed them. And cats are very... Um, Basically, what can you do for me kind of mentality. They're not like a woman, you know, it's like, what can you do for me, you know? And so, if you feed them and you, they'll never truly give you the attention they think you should deserve probably, but, or you should deserve actually, but they'll give you enough, you know? Yeah, yeah but I have cats, I have cats that follow me down the neighborhood. Really? Yeah, it's just, it's like, I'm the girl in the cat, I'm like known as a cat guy in the neighborhood. I got like 12 cats following me down the street. You, you, know? you know cats pretty well. Do, Feral cats, you can't really train them after they've been out for a while, right? Oh, They're... actually, it doesn't take long for the transition. Really? Actually, no. I mean, a neighbor of mine, uh, she picked up one of the cats. I uh, think so, Angela Alexander Roth, you know, she actually had the cats. So helped me get them spayed and neutered pretty cheaply through this uh, care, I think it's care group or something like that. Anyway, they released one back, and they were spayed and neutered while a female was picked up by one of the neighbors. And she took her in, and now that cat refuses flat out to even go look outside. <laughs> she'll, she'll, but she'll, they'll let her brothers and sisters oh, and brothers come in to see her. Yeah. They're all spayed and neutered, too, and all shots, you know. Right. So that was a real good organization. But, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good thing to do is keep them spayed <laughs> and neutered because they're placeholders. If you try to remove the feral cats, more will come in their way and come in their place. Really? So, yeah, you keep the cats spayed, neutered, and shot so they don't represent a threat to the humans if they scratch them or bite them. Oh. There's less damage, you know, less, you know, harm done, possibly. But you try to keep them as placeholders. You don't want to remove the feral cats because more will come, and they, if they're taken out, more will come back in. All right. So, yeah. We had one neighbor, John, just on this point in running, we had one neighbor that they were glad that when she moved out, she lived in the apartments across the street, and she is a cat lover, and I, I, I have dogs, but I take care of the cats on the outside. And uh, our neighbors can't stand us, but they hated her more than they hated me because she had, she'd go back there in the forest area, and she's out there feeding the raccoons and <laughs> feeding the cats. When she moved, and they made a move because they had a certain limit on how many cats you can have in the apartment. She had a whole neighborhood of cats in the apartment. And uh, they told her she had to move. And, and uh, certainly had to move when the raccoons came up there and they were getting fed. And people were complaining about all these these rodents in the, uh, in, in the area. But, uh, and then the neighbors were always fight bickering with her, particularly going behind their, their houses. There's a little... There's a little um, Street on the back area there is not a, a it's, it's a subdivision of a subdivision, and uh, back there is a lot of forest area, and she go back there and she's laying out food back there background and they out there the raccoons are feeding and the cats are out there and people just were complaining about it all the time. They didn't now I sneak out there and I try to keep them in, in my yard, but um, they don't like the idea of you having uh, wild uh, wild animals. I guess the, the way they see it. Uh, in your yard because then they call in their yard and they're over there nesting under their porches and things like that. So we're kind of like the pariahs, but 
Uh, you know, I, I just have kind of gotten used to having the feral cats around. I know it's one thing I don't have any mice in my house, so I get a benefit out of it. <laughs> yeah, one day, one day I walked up this driveway. I was going to the back driveway. I was just coming back from a walk with my dog, and there was like a line of cats, the feral cats waiting because they get fed on that back porch, back deck. And when I got up there on the railing of the deck was a possum, mm -hmm. and they're all looking down because on the deck itself eating the cat food was a skunk. <laughs> so they all lined up waiting for their turn at the feeding trough, but they all give wide berths to the skunk. Oh, it yeah. It's funny. And, I, and the cats and cats will yield to the raccoons also. They, they, they won't run from the raccoons, so they always get away from the food. And the raccoons are not going to hurt them as long as the fact they don't get in that bowl and don't, don't understand that this is a hierarchy out here, not my claws are longer than your claws. Uh, that's what that's about, but you know you have to kind of you know the animals are. Uh, yeah, I think the animals are put here for a reason, and part of it is our pleasure, and I get a lot of pleasure out of it. Uh, they seem like they appreciate the fact that if I open that door. I know they appreciate me coming out there because when I come out that door, I came out. I came out this morning and gave them some water, and and uh, you know I get had the water in the house overnight because I want the ice to thaw out and I can put the water out the next morning. I took the water out first, and that cat looked at me like. Uh, he, is that all? And then I went back in the house, got the food, and brought it out. And I, I just feel like there's a certain connection that, that they make with you. And I would have them in the garage if I didn't have dogs, but my dogs uh, can't even get along with each other. I got a, a Shih Tzu and I got a, a Boxer. And I had the Shih Tzu first, and the Boxer is there now. And uh, they get along well if they are in the room together, and, and I have the door closed so I have company come over. But... If um, I put them both outside, when they get back in the house, there's territorial uh, infighting again. They got to get re-examined who is in, in who's on first and what's on uh, second, and I don't know who's on third. And all was at home trying trying to you know figure this thing out. The boxers are pretty. <laughs> I had a boxer and she was mellow. My little dog is vicious, <laughs> and the boxer she'd rip into the boxer and the boxer just yipe. <laughs> And I was like, it's pathetic because she's big dog yiping from a little dog's biting on it. She can kill that you little dog back, especially when the little dog was a, like a puppy. And she'd just go after that big dog all the time, you know. It is. Small dogs are, are, are more prone to bite, aren't they? Yeah, they are more prone to bite because, let's face it, they don't have the intimidation factor. They know that. They yeah, know they, yeah. yeah. My, that, that's a, that, sometimes I'm getting up in the middle of the night, take the dogs out. And if that little dog, the Shih Tzu, does not want to go outside and you pick him up to go outside, his back is so straight and he's up there... Then you know how angry he is. I think you know growling, but uh, what I do is I'm taking the other dog out. I'm not getting up twice in in the middle of the night. So what I do is throw a sheet over his head and take him out there anyway, whether he want to go out or not. <laughs> but you know, animals are here for a reason. I think we in our neighborhood. I'm, I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna work on my neighbors. Is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna sensitize them to uh, knowing that putting a little food out there for the feral cats is not gonna break anybody, and it's not gonna. Make the neighborhood, you know, and there goes the neighborhood. It's not like when you move some of these people in here, they got their pants on the ground. It's a little bit different situation than that. And <laughs> your property values don't go down because you got cats around in the neighborhood and a few raccoons out there in the woods. You know, and we, I live in a, a subdivision of flat. And the way I see it is that, I mean, I look at all those trees around where my house is, and in the back is almost like a forest back there. And I look at it as, as um, well, we came out here. And we're in their neighborhood. And, um, and then, you know, I just, I, I, I always had this little thing about people going there with their picnic basket. And the way they see it is we're not bothering anybody and all of a sudden here come all the bees. And they just can't understand why these bees are attacking them. And the bees, the, I'm, I, I think I can read some of the bee language. The bees came from over there at that place and they moved them out of that neighborhood. And then they moved over here. And now that neighborhood, if I go out here in the forest where ain't no houses, there's not one house out there. And here comes somebody here, uh, some dunce cap, with a picnic basket, put a table over there. And then when the bees come down there to get them out of their neighborhood, they can't understand what the bees are doing. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, 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 you know the humans are working. We have to continue to work on ourselves until we can understand what our role is. And then understand there's some room for some other uh, species on the planet. And all that is what makes the world, you know, what it is and what makes the world go around, so to speak. And it takes, you know, more than a village to raise a child. It takes a whole lot of other elements in it. You have to have animals where they can learn how to take care of something that is unlike themselves. I mean, there's a lot of learning goes on in that. And uh, animals have their, have, have their place. So that's not Black History Month. That's uh, the animal planet. <laughs> 
you know, so uh, we came here to talk about this book, and I'm telling you about my cats. And uh, I'm telling, I'm gonna tell my neighbors to uh, lighten up when I get back to the uh, residence. Uh, before getting to the book, and I am going to talk about page 105 of this book, as I promised last week. But you know, there are a lot of things going on out there right now. Uh, this uh, shooting incident that occurred in uh, Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina, not very far away from um, the uh, campus uh, there, uh, UNC, that these uh, three Muslims were going to. And I had a couple of people write on, on um, I did a post on that on, on Facebook. And one of the persons, uh, you know, sometimes what happens, they'll, they'll repost what I write. Some of the ones read my posts uh, daily because I post on a daily basis. And one of the person reposted it. So I, when, that, when that person, I won't call the name out, but when that person reposted my articles, I always go on that post to read the comments because there's one person on there that is uh, a nemesis. And anything I write, if I say up, then down's the answer. If I say down, the answer's up. And I go on that post because I got to come behind this guy and, uh, and get him off, uh, off, my, off my wall, off anything I write. So, I was writing about the Chapel Hill incident where these three Muslims were killed. And, of course, everybody knows, they don't have to do an investigation here. Three Muslims were killed, so it's because of the attack on Islam. So, here's this guy making that case. No evidence now. But in, when I was talking, when I got into a discussion with him, uh, not with him, but on, on that wall, about what had occurred in Copenhagen, Denmark, then all of a sudden he wanted to know, the same person out there had, had no problem with the leap of faith that this was about an attack upon uh, Muslims, that he had no, he wanted me to prove that the attack in Copenhagen, which resembled the same circumstance of the attack in Paris, France, with Charlie Hebdo, show me where the evidence is that this was a Muslim, you know, based attack. And I asked him, why didn't you need, why didn't I need, you, why didn't you need some evidence about uh, this person uh, went off in, um, in, in North Carolina? Well, he was saying, well, nobody goes off because of a, a parking space. I asked him, uh, apparently they don't have any crazy people where you live which is impossible because you're there. And he didn't like that too much, but I have to zing him every once in a while because, you know, when I, when I meet somebody like this guy, and it's very clear he doesn't like me, and guess what? I'm willing to um, return. Uh, that's one favor I'm willing to return. I mean, this idea that you love everybody, I don't love everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Because, of love, because as, as Ayn Rand said, I quote Ayn Rand a lot. Because she makes the most sense to me. Although I think that um, this Canadian philosopher, who really is one of the ones that criticized Ayn Rand, I got, I got, going, I got the first two parts of it down. You got a four-part series on, on Ayn Rand. And I got to go and read part, listen to part three. Because part three is where he's critiquing her objectivism and I want to read I want to hear what he has to say about that you know it's like um actually the best critic so she I pretty much his sound would have I've heard him speak on and I've listened to about 12 of his videos uh -huh. you know they're like <clears throat> 45 minutes to an hour and a half they a lot of times mm -hmm. um <clears throat> he, he started out as an objectivist I could say that that's yeah, he did. He did. but actually some of the best critics I've actually met of objectivism and there's many there, there's many objective you know there's many good criticisms of it um you know but it basically the people still embrace the idea of uh of uh, you know individuality being embraced over collective mentality, but oh yes. yeah, but I think that's foundational. But he definitely Stephen Molyneux is actually a very. I mean, I, I I saw him one time. You watched him more than I did. And I started watching him on YouTube, mm -hmm. and um, he is quite original. He is quite original. Oh, he's always oh, very original. He's original because his um he's all over the place. He's an atheist, but he also actually sees there's a difference, a marked difference between how Christians handle things in the modern era than um. You know, you know, the Muslims do. And then Obama saying that to prayer breakfast, you know, saying they get, Christians got to get off their high horse. So he points back to yes, events man. that happened a thousand years ago. Like we should all be chagrined now yeah. that that happened. I mean, it's like ridiculous. I mean, 
I mean, it's what, gone what, from ridiculous to absurd. I mean, it's like that's part of that cosmic justice the liberals believe in, though. They believe that they could make somebody now suffer some indignity to undo the past. So now the people who were wronged allegedly in the past mm -hmm. will be now considered at rest. Yeah, it's it's whacked. I mean, for and other things too. How can atheists who don't believe in spirituality or anything? Embrace that mentality because dead is dead, you know, and that the world just turns on without, you know, in regard to what happened and the people that it affected. So how can they use this? They use a Christian morality mm -hmm. or trying to use a Christian morality to say that now you got to pay this price for for eternity and yeah. you'll never be able to escape. It's like a, your karma that you cannot escape. Yeah, and it's never they're never it's never to be satisfied. Well, I did, I, I would have more respect for the agnostic than I will the atheist the agnostic will say <clears throat> that they don't really know I, I could accept that but for the atheist their idea is that they do know and uh, there's enough um, information just in the scheme of things to show there is a designer now as to all aspects of what that means that's another thing but there are that is certainly a design. You ever hear about Anthony? And there cannot be a design without a designer. Hey, keep it up. But do you ever hear of a man named Anthony Flew? He was the foremost uh, atheist in the United, the world at one time. He wrote a lot of books on it. He was a, he was a professor from university, one of the universities at England. Uh -huh. And just prior to his death, he died in 2007, 2008, or something like that. But he actually accepted that there was a creator. Now he didn't embrace a creed, but he actually said the DNA. The more he st found out about DNA, the more he found out about the all the information encoded in DNA. Mm -hmm. He said he just had a harder time accepting that was just by sheer randomness. So, I mean, in, but uh, he never embraced the creator, like I said. He never professed to be a uh, follower of Jesus or Muhammad or anything else like that. But he actually said that, and he wrote, There is a God. There was a book called There is a God. And I got it, if you ever want to read it sometime. But he actually builds up, and it basically is the crux of it, though, is DNA's got too much information just to be a random thing, in his opinion, okay? And let's face it, an agnostic, we all have doubts. So, I mean, is some of that word... I have a lot of doubts. We, have, we all have doubts. I mean, it does sound preposterous. Some guy with a great... I mean, they, the way they conceptualize God, with a, beard, a guy with a long beard and uh, aged and all this mm -hmm. stuff, it does sound bizarre. But see, God is never referred to or even fully described in the Scripture itself. He's always out there in the periphery, but he's never truly knowable. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, I have... My doubts are what we... Uh, write about uh, that because the the writer is always limited by the human experience. You cannot be a a person that's limited writing about that which has no limits, that which is infinite. See, Wittgenstein, I think, struck upon it. He said so. There are doubts about it in terms of the uh, the storyline. See, Wittgenstein, Ludwig Wittgenstein, basically, he he kept emphasizing language, and he said there is no real philosophical problems. It's language problems. The thing is, conceptualizing something that's almost inconceptualizable, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's basically, even when they describe the Big Bang or whatever, they're talking about one event that started every all the chain of events and now we it led up to accommodates in us. If you parallel that with the Christian or the Judeo-Christian concept of the idea of creation, there's so many parallels between that. The order of creation, you know, it seems to be roughly parallel to it. Yeah. Okay, the, time, the only thing that's missing in the timeline is millions of years in Scripture. They just refer to it as days, but... Let's face it, when you're talking to primitive people, millions and billions of years is something beyond them. They were dealing with flocks of sheep and goats. I mean, there the, would be inconceivable to say billions when they just had maybe they consider 10,000 goats the ultimate amount of goats you're going to have in the world. So, I mean, they didn't have the way to conceptualize that. Yeah. yeah. Well, John, can you imagine, uh, we're, we're in a book right now in our study group, and we're studying the book uh, called Osiris and the Egyptian Resurrection written by E. Wallace Budge, E.A. Wallace Budge who was the keeper of the antiquities at the British Museum, uh, both the antiquities of Egypt and also Assyria. And uh, some of the people in the, in the study group were saying how complex the book was and how difficult it was to, to understand it. And I was um, saying last week that look, when you look at the two ways of looking at Egypt's history, you see, you read Egypt's history based upon what Egyptians wrote for their own use, and also what's been written about Egypt by those who were the classical writers who wrote about Egypt from what they were told by the Egyptians. And you have to understand that in the translation of both, there are some problems you have in trying to translate it because the medium in which you are 
translating is different and also the time frame in which it's being translated is also different. So things change over time. But can you imagine though when you're talking about an extraterrestrial type of explanation of things where you're trying to explain the cosmos and you're limited in terms of where you are in that dispensation. You can imagine the confusion. Let's say there is a voice that's in fact talking to these people who wrote this this down. You can imagine the tremendous um, uh, even if you if you guide in the hand, you know, uh, as they say, occurred. The tremendous gap there would be in terms of an understanding of what they're writing about because they're not experiencing on the same level in which it's being told. The, the, human, the human experience is not changed because you're talking beyond the human experience. The human experience in which it's being talked into is still the same. The vessel remains the same. So the understanding is limited because of that particular particularization of the instruments being poured into. And you imagine, that's what they say in, in Latin when they translate uh, anything in one of the books written by Gerald Massey. It says, uh, tradutere traitore, which means translator traitor. It doesn't mean you're trying to get it wrong, but it just means that there's something lost in the translation, even if the, uh, the, the, the unfolding of the information is perfect, is not perfectly written down. It can't be, because there's a human element involved in writing it. All, all things that are written are suspect. So no matter how high the source is and the, the, the person trying to get it right, there's always something to be said about the particularization of it in terms of how specific is the accuracy. It can be 99% accurate. And of course the overarching, what we do as Christians, we take the overarching concepts and we're trying even now to ferret out what sense does it make because we're still trying to find out what all of it means. And um, I do a study with a group every Thursday, come by my house, they're, they're there religiously. If I turn them, no, not to come by, they, they're hurt and their feelings are hurt. But I, I listen to all, all sides. And these are the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses that come by. And you can believe it, you let them in your house one time, they're, ne they're there next week. And before I knew it, I had a, a weekly session. <laughs> That's what I would have had. And sometimes I, I don't have that hour and a half. If I say no, then I know I'm, I'm not being hospitable. So I say yes, no matter what my time is. And I make up for it on the other side once they leave. But they're going to be there. And I study with them uh, just because I want to hear what they have to say. And I want to tell them what I got to say. And um, we, have a very, we have a very good relationship. I, I don't try to teach during the time when they're teaching. I'm a listener at that point. I'm, see, because I, I think that in order to be a teacher, you have to be a good student also. And I'm also a student. And so when they're doing their um, teaching, you know, I'm 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 raising questions about it. I may be asking critical questions, but I'm asking questions within the context of what they're talking about because I want to find out exactly what they're saying. And you know, I have my own ideas about about some things which I don't share because I'm not in that. I'm not a teacher at that point, so I listen to their truth. They enjoy that because they know I'm I'm an, I'm an instructor, so they enjoy the fact that I'm willing to sit there and um, have a conversation about it. But I think we all have to admit that we are imperfect in our understanding, no matter how perfect it's written in terms of what's, what's uh, written, our understanding of it is, is, uh, is, is imperfect. And it has to be that way. And we have to understand that is, that is really true. So when I, when I study anything, I understand that there are limits, particularly if you talk about a translation of something. And when I hear the King James Version of the Bible, which goes back to 1611, and thank you, I appreciate it. The, the King James Version of the Bible, which goes back to uh, King James. That's, that's what you're talking about. King James is um, the first of the Stuart Kings. Came in after the last of the Tudors, which was Queen Elizabeth. Excuse me. And it was um, James I that came in in 1603. And he was a king of England from 1603 to 1625. You can check all of that out. We are not CNN. We're not embellishing anything here. And um, James I was the person that decided that they didn't want to listen to, to Rome anymore and decided that they need to have their own Bible translated out of the um, Latin and do what they had done in Germany in 1517 when they wrote the um, the Gutenberg Bible, which um, 
Martin Luther uh, uh, had um, undertaken and some of the others undertaken in the 16th century. And so therefore, they are, what they are doing is breaking away from Rome and they're setting up their own understanding of it and they're translating it out of the uh, Greek into the Latin and out of the Latin into other languages and now it's in English. And uh, God is speaking in, these are new, uh, English is a new language, so when you start translating into English, it wasn't even an uh, English language at that time, so it wasn't intended for it to be translated out of English since the language didn't exist. So you can imagine what problem that creates. And so I have to put on there, this is the King James Version. Okay, fine. That's his version. And uh, there are some other, if, if you want to, <laughs> if you want to read about King James I, go read the book written by um, David Wallachensky, Amy Wallace, and Irvin Wallace called The Book of Lists. John, have you, John, have you read that book called The Book of Lists uh, by... Um, by, uh, I, re I read that when it first came out, one in the 70s, some yeah, the late yeah. 70s. Yeah, I don't know if there's a different version of it. No, but that, they, had, they had several of them, but that's, the one you're talking about is what I'm talking about here. They had, they had one, since it, it sold so well, they did one above that, and they went to the, uh, one called, uh, it was the second version of the Book of Lists, another Book of Lists. But the first one was really the primary uh, source of that. That was an amazing book. And it, it was amazing for what they pointed out. Uh, uh, go look at, uh, there's one they had of the, World's renowned, uh, how do I say this? The world's renowned, it's a family network, and we're not embellishing anything here, but I have to say what's true. World's renowned homosexuals, and they have on number 17 on that list, uh, and I remember this perfectly, is King James I. Now, I don't know what that has to do with the translation of, of the Bible. I know this, though. That when they were putting together the Bible at the Nicene Conference, and they came in there with some stuff that Constantine didn't approve of, I know what happened there at the Nicene Conference. I, I do um, I do what happened with the uh, I can if you go on to the uh, I do know what happened with the what how that affects the translation. Uh, um, James um, actually. The King James Version of the Bible, what we call the King James, uh -huh. was actually largely based upon the already translations that existed, the Bishop's Bible being one of them, and Geneva Bible. Mm -hmm. But the Geneva Bible was written by people who were exiles, English, English exiles, who went to Geneva, Switzerland, for religious persecution during the Queen Mary reign, because she was trying to reassert the Catholic power, the Catholic's power into England, bring it back in. So anyway... Um, in that the doc the, the commentary along with the the, uh, the Geneva Bible though ran half almost half the length of the Bible itself was actually notes from the people who are translating it and the reformers and it was actually giving credence to the uh, to an idea to uh, to um, justify upraising it against kings and um, he didn't want that in there so he had a strict largely stricken so he did take a lot of the stuff out of there a lot of the uh, he you know a lot of this stuff was in the Geneva Bible and I have a copy of it a facsimile copy mm -hmm. but um if you ever want to look at that it's pretty it's pretty it's written in old English but anyway yeah he he had posed that because of political grounds basically but you got to give him credit in this he tried to make the Bible more available to the average person yeah than no anybody person. else ever did mm -hmm. sure and, and if, if the Bible had been available to the Crusaders and all the times that you know and people could read and write you mm -hmm. know the abuses oh they like the Obama made that reference to the abuses would not occur because they said that's not in our scripture. But people, the priestly class of the Roman Catholic Church, were the only ones there who were allowed back then to be able to read it and interpret it. Yeah. And people were not even allowed. It, it was very discouraged to mm -hmm. actually own a Bible amongst the Catholics. Yeah. Well, you know, the six, six, the six or six books in the Bible, the uh, 39 in the Old Testament and the 27 in the New Testament, you know that there were 18 books that were judged at the Nicene Conference to be apocryphal. Uh, have you ever seen a copy of the uh, the lost books of the Bible? Yeah, I got a copy of got that. A copy of that. Do, do you have the combined? It's, sometimes you'll see a combined. They'll have the lost books of the Bible and the forgotten books of Eden. And they have it in the same volume. I don't have that one. But have I, have the, the, I also yeah. just got one, too, where the it's the books of the Bible that the Ethiopian Coptic churches uses. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they actually have like almost close to 80 books total in the, their Bible. Yeah. Rather, you know, and they have a more. They have two or three more, four more books that the Roman Catholics don't even have. Uh, the you know, it's very, it's very interesting mm -hmm. too. And there's sure. references in the Bible we know, in the Book of Jude. And that's the point. Yeah. The Bible we know. The Bible we know. Mm -hmm. The Book of Jude, especially the King James Version. Mm -hmm. There is a reference to a book that's not. I'm just using this one of the examples. Mm -hmm. There's a reference right in the Book of Jude, right before you get to Book of Revelations. It's about where uh, Archangel Michael. There's a reference to Archangel Michael and Satan contending over the body of Moses. Mm -hmm. Well, that whole little story is not found anywhere in the Bible we have. 
I think it was uh, uh, Enoch, the book of Enoch that came from, right. which was not included even, I don't even think the, um, I don't even know if the Catholics even have that in the, included in their apocryphal, the books that we consider apocryphal. So, yeah, it's... it's yeah, uh, apocryphal, and that's decided at the Nicene Conference where uh, they uh, took 18 of these um, books and said that can't go in there because it is not canonical. So when they ask me, which do I believe in the Bible, my answer is, when I'm being feeling a little bit more pertinent, pertinent and a little bit more provocative, I'll ask him which one. But um, I understand what they're saying, that you believe in the Bible that we all have, and we have the King James Version of the Bible. But there are many different Bibles out there. You can go read the Jerome Bible, the Latin Bible, you can, or the Vulgate. Uh, you can read the Gutenberg Bible, and these all, and then read the, read the King James Bible, and you get all these different translations. And um, then you got the uh, Bible that's being translated by the Jehovah's Witnesses. They they have their translation, and uh, they say that the meaning is the, is the same, but there are some words that change to make it more more clear. Well, more clear uh, based upon you changing it. Well, that there's a change though. And so the clarity is your clarity, and it's assumed to be a universal clarity that's given from on high, but it wasn't at the beginning, otherwise you wouldn't be, wouldn't be changing it. But these are things we have to take in consideration. But in terms of the overarching um, aspect uh, of it, I think that the denunciation of it because there is not this absolutism in place fails to understand the particularization of the problem, the particularization in, the, in this extent is that we're talking into a limited understanding, a vessel that has limited understanding of a universal principle that you can only be in the universal mindset to understand that. I mean, I just figured out myself, quite frankly, you know, I, it took me a long time, to, I'm, I'm so so simple-minded, it took me a long time to understand which one came first, the chicken or the egg. I finally figured that one out. And I'll let you think about that between now and next week. Because of what now? Because I'm going to do what I said I was going to do when I first got here. You know, I like to go, <laughs> I like to go off on these tangents because John and I have so much fun here at the studio. And John's a philosopher, so, you know, we, uh, we, we have a lot of talks off, off, the, uh, off camera. And I have to discipline myself. When I come before the camera, I have to discipline myself because there's so many different energies that you come here with. And uh, we have an idea what we want to talk about, but you don't know what the flow is. And when the flow is something and... You didn't plan for it. Be ready to go with that. And uh, we, we sometimes we do that. But we're back now to what we're, we're going to talk about the last part of the program. And that is this wonderful book I said earlier that is written by George Yete. And yet George Yete has four different major works out. Now he's written some smaller works. But the, the four major works that he has out, and I read all four of them. And I, I'll tell you that he's one of those writers that does, that does not. Uh, here's the word now we're using today, doesn't embellish <laughs> the truth. I don't know how you embellish the truth. Um, and that's why he's outside, that's why he's an outsider, by the way. You go to these, these universities and when they have these conferences, I, I'll tell you this. They're getting ready to bring uh, Angela Davis in here uh, on the 23rd uh, to, the, one, uh, to the local university. I can I, I bet you I can bet you this. This is Black History Month. Georgia Yitch has written four books. You can believe this. He ain't coming in here. And I haven't seen Georgia Yitch invited to any of these other programs either. And when they have these conferences, I don't see him there <clears throat> because he doesn't. Um, what's the word here now? He doesn't embellish the truth as if the truth needs to be embellished. And he didn't do it in this book right here. Now, he's written four books. This one's called Africa Unchained. But the other three books, and they're, they're all major works. Uh, one called, now, now, he better not go back to uh, Africa and say this one, Africa in Chaos, Africa in Chaos, where he's pulling the, 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 the rug from underneath these people that want to claim that Africa is in chaos because of the colonial period. Africa was, was less chaotic during that time period than it is right now. <clears throat> and more developed than it is now. And I'll give you an example of that. I have a friend, uh, uh, Nicholas uh, Scofield, who was one of the Africanas uh, from uh, one of the Dutch 
in, uh, in South Africa. He became a very good friend of mine when I was there in 2007. I know they're glad to see me go when I, when I left out of there. But I stay in touch with him. I was asking him, how is South Africa doing right now since uh, Mandela, who had the vision to stay there one term and then gave it up, and so it's hard for them to be dictators in South Africa the same way they are dictators everywhere else in Africa, practically speaking, because Mandela set a tone, a George Washington tone, because the world was looking at him, and he had no other choice in the matter in a lot of ways to step down and show some um, pizzazz. People have, have called for you to be uh, uh, taken out of jail in 1990, and you were in there 27 years, and you come out in 1991, and then what are you going to do once you get power? Well, they couldn't do a lot of things they did, too much of an international glare. But I was asking my friend, uh, Nicholas, how are things now that Mandela and uh, you know stepped down, and now we have this annual election of the uh, of the Hausa, uh, not the Zulus, which is the majority of the people in South Africa. I've been to the Krayal, the, the Zulu Krayal in South Africa. Uh, they're trying to leave it like it was when Shaka was there. Shaka was born in South Africa in 1787, the same year as our Constitution was drawn up in Philadelphia. He died in 1828. And I was um, uh, there, and I and I saw, you know, saw a pretty, you know, I mean, it's a beautiful country, and particularly in Cape Town, the mountains and all of that. And I was asking how are things going now that they is falling in the hands of the um, the kleptocrats, the indigenes, those that can't keep their the, the hands uh, out of the purse, the, the treasury. And he was telling me about the downward slide is on and all of that. So George Yeti were right about that. Talk about African chaos. He talks about Africa in the aftermath of the colonial period. And does not trace the chaos is in right now back to the colonial times because you cannot trace it back there. Just like you can't trace the things happening in the black community back to slavery. Now I don't know how you go back there and claim that you can't walk down the street right now because somebody was enslaved back in the time period in the cotton field. Why? Because they're walking down the street during the time period they had cotton fields. And you can forget that. That is not what, what it's traced to. And when George Eaton doesn't write about that, he didn't get invited because that's not the claim that he's making. Well, African Chaos is one of his books. Africa Unchained is one of his books. Here's one nobody wants to um, talk about at any of these conferences. I've not been to one. I go to a lot of them. I've not been to one where they discuss his book. I don't even hear him raise their name. But try to uh, find this book, Africa Africa. Betrayed. I don't see it. I don't see any of those books on the book. You know how they put these book spreads outside these meetings? I never seen any of those, those books. And they're certainly not going to put this one out there. They wrote call. It's always a major work. So I mean, nothing writes is less than um, how many pages would this book be? This one is five about 500 pages. I don't think anything is written. Is less than 350 pages, so these are major books then, just the size of it. And the other book he has out is called Indigenous African Institutions, and I have never seen, I've been to a lot of conferences, I've never seen um, a book that was out there on those spreads of all these books now in this department, this area of, of concentration, concentrated area of African studies. This man is a major writer. I've never seen him his books on display anywhere. I have never even heard the man's name mentioned, and I think this is the reason why on page 105 of this book called Africa Unchained. George Yete is writing about the slave trade. Now I know everybody's gonna get the, in their mind when I say the slave trade. They're gonna be talking about the European, they're gonna call it the European slave trade. And it wasn't until Basil Davidson finally came out with a book. He first of all called it Africa Mother, African Mother. But later on, he changed the name from African Mother to, and listen to this name here, he called it the African Slave Trade. And that didn't win him any friends whatsoever, although Bessa Davidson was a major writer uh, of West African history, and also uh, African history in general. Just a major Africanist, European. But he, write honestly, he wrote honestly about Africa. And there are people trying to act like he was in a certain school of thought and can't read anything by him, take it with a grain of salt. But Basil Davidson was a serious writer. 
and he when he called that book was was once which was once called African Africa Africa Mother. He changed the name of the book to the African Slave Trade, and when he did that, the shan hit the fan because the idea was he's changing the discourse from the European slave trade. And he's calling that slave trade the African slave trade. Didn't go over very well because the idea was Alex Haley. You know, uh, that nonsense that he wrote about in 1976 when he put his uh, roots out, came out, and then they put it into a series uh, on TV. Uh, that's, I think, the same station. I think, no, that was, CB was it CBS or was it where Brian Williams would later on come in? He's in. So, anyways, they had Alex Haley embellishing before Brian Williams got there. I mean, there's a lot of embellishing going on. Uh, those, it, it, and those that don't embellish, you don't get invited. And he didn't embellish, talking about uh, George Yete, didn't embellish on page 105. Let me read what he says here. He's talking about another slave trade. When I say the slave trade, everyone's going to be thinking about the European slave trade. Or, let's put it in its proper context, the African slave trade. And it should be called the African slave trade. Because we have to separate the slave trade from the slavery. I'll be doing a piece on, on that in terms of, because uh, I'll I, I be doing a, a lecture next uh, Sunday at this one church. And I'm going to be saying something nobody's ever said before. I'll be talking about with a separate Dr. King's vision of I Have a Dream from the Civil Rights Movement. Two different things. Everybody want to act like the vision was the movement. That's why they want to act like we still got the civil rights movement going on. Because we want to talk about the vision. You never have the vision. The vision is, 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 is an ideal. I have a dream. That one day. Well, one day. Yeah, that's a dream. That's, a, that's an ideal. But the mission, which was the civil rights movement, that is over. You forget that. There's no civil rights movement today. These guys are imposters. And that's why they don't invite me to any of these meetings. Because that's what I'm going to say. And so, Georgia, you tell you, I understand what you're doing in this book. And you're talking about a slave trade. That everybody thinks I'm talking about the uh, European slave trade. I even think I'm talking about the African slave trade in terms of how it played out in the West. I'm not talking about this, either one of those. Although, if you're talking about the European slave trade, that slave trade does not even exist. This is an African slave trade. And without the African participation in it and without them running it, it doesn't happen. And I'll tell you my experience here. Uh, all you Afrocentrists out there, because you're not going to say it publicly because you, you know who you're talking to. You'll say it in private, and you'll write me in private. So that's how you handle your business. But I sat next to, uh, she didn't think I knew her, but I was, when I was in Ghana in Accra, I went to a dinner, and uh, I knew I was sitting, I, I made a portrait sitting next to a, a kosher um, Purby, Dr. Purby. And she didn't think I knew her. And I, when, they, when we were sitting out at the, at the table and all the professors were having dinner, two of them from the United States and the rest of them from the University of, uh, the University of Ghana at, Le, at, Le, at uh, Lagan, L-E-G-O-N, the University of, and I don't even know why they call it the University of, of uh, Ghana and, La, and Lagan because it's the only one university there and that's where it's located. It ain't like, you know, University of Michigan, Flint, University of Michigan, Arbor, University of Michigan, Dearborn. It wasn't even that. It was just one university. And um, I, anyway, I made a point to next to, next to a coach, a coach of Purvey. And I told her that I uh, want to tell her how much I respect I have for her for coming out and saying as she did on page 206, well, she didn't say it, it was written by Gates in his book called uh, The Wonders of the African World, which is Gates' uh, two cents of information. He didn't know what he was talking about 90% of the time. But on page 207 and 208 of the book called Wonders of the African World, which is a book that accompanied the, the series he put out on PBS in 2000, called One of the African World. It's a six-part series. And I give Gates a lot of credit. It was a travelogue. He, he admits it's not a historical piece, but it's a travelogue. He traveled in Africa. He reported what he saw putting on camera. And uh, PBS, that way, and that way he can maintain his tenure. 
Uh, he didn't know anything, but uh, that's another point. And it shows in that film how, how Lily knew. And I, I, I met him over in Ann Arbor. I had to kind of say a few things in his ear. Because when he got in Egypt and started that, I had to ask him some questions about that. But uh, <laughs> I like to jam these guys up, to be honest with you, because um, they're sickening. Uh, and, and anyway, I said next to Perby, and I told her that in the Gates book, I really wanted to say I appreciate what you did there. Because that kind of honesty and integrity is lost in, in America in many ways with these so-called scholars who will not say the truth. Because they're doing what? What's that word again now? They want to embellish it. See, Brian Williams, you're not alone. You have a lot of company here. Everybody's embellishing everything. Particularly with these modifiers. So anyway, I sit next to her and I told her how much I appreciated her, Dr. Purby. Because it took a lot of um, pizzazz on your part to say that in order for the slave trade to have taken place in West Africa, you had to get the permission of the African leaders. And in that case there, it would be the Ashanti. And she's Ashanti herself. And for her to, in fact, point backwards toward her own group, took a lot of courage on her part to do that. But that's a truth if the truth is going to be told. And then when they have the contract, when the uh, group called the Ashanti lost the contract, or the Oyo lost the contract to the Dinka Ara, that's another group in West Africa you don't hear too much about, but when they when when the war was fought, the contract was then transferred over to the other group. And that's what that's when the Portuguese were transcended by the Dutch, the contract was still in place then that they followed the contract that had been held by the previous group. But you weren't going in there kicking doors down and going into the interior part of Africa. It didn't it didn't work that way. So this is the African slave trade. Now when I say the slave trade in this case right here, I'm not talking really about that slave trade. There's another slave trade we don't talk about. And this is the one that's on page 105 of Yete's book. And because he talks about it, he's not going to get invited anywhere. They're not interested in hearing this. Because he's bringing in a slave trade by slave masters that don't allow you to appeal to their guilt. They're not paying you any money to bring this up. There's only one group. And I, and I will tell you, there's only one group you can bring up slavery where the group who wasn't even there, but a part of the group that was involved in it, but it was involved on both black and white, on, on the black side and the white side, and the black side initiating it, and they don't feel guilty. And there's only one group that you can point slave trade out to, and there's any guilt attached to it. So guess why he's being brought up as if that's the only slave trade? And guess why? Is brought up that way. You see why, what's going on here? It's because of the fiduciary aspect to it. Not because it is single, the singularity of it in terms of how it played out in history. Well, George Yates is talking about the slave trade as it plays out in another part of the slave trade. The slave trade that preceded the slave trade um, that Europe was involved in. And that, in fact, follows the slave trade that was carried out among the indigenous in Africa itself. Because all slave trades start out among the indigenous populations everywhere. And if you don't believe that, go read page 111 of Thomas Sowell's book in chapter 4. And page 111 is the very first page in chapter 4. If that's not true, come back here. Because that you can prove that we embellish, that's a word now, embellish the, um, the information. But that's on page 111 of that book, chapter 4 of the book. Here's what he says in, in this, in, uh, here's what George Yitte says in a nutshell in running. The claim, here's what people say. The claim that Arabs were involved in the trade at all is a mischievous invention of the West. That's what we persons say. When, they, when we talk about the, after, the Arab slave trade, they want to say it's an invention of the West to make Islam look bad. What Yitte says, and he won't get invited to any conference because of it, he says, Black Africans know better. If the Europeans had not colonized Africa, the Arabs would have. And the Arabs never forgave the West for beating them to the punch. 
Well, the Arabs did beat them to the punch in terms of slave trade, but what they did, they backed off of the colonization of Africa because they wanted to have some place to pick their slaves out of. And if they had, in fact, made the slaves part of Islam, they wouldn't have anything to pick out of there for the slave trade. So they did not do that. They never envisioned that coming behind them, there would be a colonization of Africa by Europe. What he's saying there is that when Europe came in, after the slave trade had run its course in in, uh, in Africa, because the, the colonial period is after uh, slavery, you can date the colonial period 1884 to 1935 pretty much. Well, after that is over, then you have the, um, the colonial period. And he says here, the Arabs never forgave the Europeans for beating them to the colonial aspect of Africa, but the slave trade itself preceded, preceded Europe. So that's what Yiti is saying, and that's why this book here is formative. Read this and along with um, the book by Thomas Sowell called uh, Black Rednecks, they don't want to hear that either, and White Liberals, and they don't want to hear that. And there are no conferences they're going to be invited to anytime soon during Black History Month. If they invite George Yiti to the conference at the university where I am, I faint, or any other university. Okay, we've got to get out of here. <laughs> we did it. We'll see you next week. And we want you to always follow your dream because if you don't follow your dream, you'll never know what's on the other side of the rainbow. <laughs>